Hello everyone, thank you for welcoming us into your spaces today. So good to be here. Yeah. Good to be here with you, I Alan. I know, I'm glad to be a part of this. So we're um, experiencing the after Christmas sort of whatever, let down or maybe, <laughs> maybe encouragement depending on how your Christmas celebration was, but we are grateful just to be a part of your spiritual journey today. So thanks for welcoming us into your home. Yes, for sure. And if you're not getting communication from us, emails, we would love for you to stay in the loop. And you can do that by simply emailing info at cccgreeley.org. So you can be in the know of what's happening here. You can always go to our website too under coming up and see all the things that are going to be happening now. Yeah, this weekend's a little unique in that we are not having any in-person services this weekend. We wanted to give our volunteers and staff a much deserved, well-deserved break. Um, and so we recognize many of you are engaging online, maybe when you're usually here in person. And so we want to especially welcome you um, as part of our, our worship experience today. Yeah. And through the month of December, we have been highlighting this journey we've been through in 2020 and all the things that God was doing, God was at work, pandemic or not. And so we have one more ministry that we'd like to highlight here today. So take a look at this. So when I realized everything had to change about the way I'd been doing ministry for the last 15 years, you know, that, that there was a sense of frustration. There was a sense of um, fear to a degree, if I'm being honest. And that quickly actually turned to uh, anticipation, hope, and joy over what this new unique opportunity presented us with. My feelings were we are the perfect church for this because we're constantly adapting and changing the way that we do things and how we do things. I think one of the biggest things that I held on to right at the start of all this unfolding was I knew deep down that God was not worried. He is going to continue to move through his people no matter what situation his people are in. Who would have thought that a student ministry could grow during a time of a national global pandemic? You know, at the beginning of summer, we launched these things called house parties. And here's like the beautiful thing. It took our large student ministry and it allowed us to take these students and to put them into these like groups with 15 to 20 other kids, a couple leaders who know them. And, and it's basically a small youth ministry. So instead of being one mass ministry, we are a bunch of small youth ministries. And the beauty is this. Students who come, they're known. It's like, no, we know your story. We know how to pray for you by name. We know what's going on in your life. We get to actually walk with you through that week by week. And it has just been so beautiful to see the community that has developed in all of these different house parties we have. What I've noticed about college students, they have lots of time and most of them have very little money. So time is what they give. Seeing the impact of that time that they've given has been incredible. There are groups of college students meeting with refugees from Africa and helping them acclimate to an entirely different culture and way of life that they're used to. And they just see a need and without thinking they just give up what they have to meet that need uh, in such a selfless way it has been really inspiring to see. The program isn't the goal, the people are, the relationships are. Uh, and so for me, my hope is simply this, is I want to keep Jesus the main thing. I want to keep relationships the main thing. I want to keep discipleship the main thing. And I'm excited that we've got amazing leaders who are passionate about this, who give up time to be a part of this. We've got parents who are hosting these house parties who are excited about this direction. And most of all, we've got students who are excited. Don't get me wrong. I would love for it to be possible for every seat to be sat on in our sanctuary. That would be incredible. But beyond weekend services, the other things that have been birthed from this open opportunity, this heartbeat of adaptation and growth and innovation, I would hate for those things to disappear. Here's all the opportunities that stand before the church. Are we gonna rise to the occasion or are we gonna get caught up in the logistics and the limitations? And what I've seen Christ Community do is stand up and rise to the occasion and spread influence throughout these opportunities that have kind of unfolded in front of us. 
That is so fun uh, seeing uh, what God is doing in our student ministries and our college ministries. Those, this, even with COVID, some amazing yeah. things have been happening mm -hmm. and uh, really excited about what God is doing, uh, not only in that area, but in so many areas of our church. Yeah. And uh, we want to, again, just invite you to partner um, in what God is doing through your generosity. That's the reason that any of these ministries are happening. It's through our collective generosity as a church. Raylene and I love investing in um, this church financially, and we know so many of you um, are investing as well. And so I want to just remind you, we're, um, this is kind of, we're nearing year end, obviously, and um, we are uh, in, a, in a situation where we're still behind budget and needing to really close that gap. And so we would just ask you to pray, ask the Lord, if he would want you to um, be a part of closing that gap and tr strategically investing in what God is doing here at Christ Community. There are a number of ways to give. You're familiar with that. Um, just make sure if you want it in this year, 2020, you do need to get it to us um, by uh, the 31st, December 31st. But you can write a check. You can give online, text to give, various ways to give. But again, we're just so grateful for your investment and partnership in what God is doing through Christ community. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to get ready to go into our message here. KJ is actually teaching today. And if you're watching this on our online experience on the Church Online platform, he's here in the chat right now. So go ahead and connect with him and share your thoughts as he is teaching. Um, but I want to pray for you. Let's pray together so we can center our hearts and listen to this word that God has for us today. Jesus, we come to you longing for more. We long for more of you. We want to experience the reality of your presence today as we intentionally set aside this time to connect with you, to listen to you, and to pay attention to what you're doing, to what you want to do in us today, through us. So open our hearts. Here we are, Holy Spirit. I bless my friends that are here with us right now. Fill this place where they're in. In Jesus' name, amen. Enjoy the message. We are at the point that 2020 one is almost here. It feels kind of like ever since February of 2020, everyone has been pointing to 2021. Like it is almost here. You can taste it. And furthermore, it's the time that people are beginning to say, it's a new year. Thank God it's a new year. Everything is going to be different. Everything is going to change. And I think I personally have that perspective every year. It's this, it's this time that it feels kind of like I get a second chance or a third chance or I get a 41st chance at life. And, and so then I think about all these things I'm going to do to improve uh, who I am and the things that, that I um, hope to grow in. And so I, 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 I put these goals down on paper and sometimes I achieve the goals and sometimes I don't. Um, but it feels as if there's um, th this like theme of hope that's in the air because everything else has been disappointing. It's following the Christmas season as it's typically celebrated, right? Like December the 25th, it just happened. We celebrate the birth of Christ. Advent brings us up to December the 25th. It prepares our hearts for, for, for peace and hope and joy and love. And we're like, we're, we're just so ready for Christmas. And then it happens. And the day after, December 26th just feels so meh. And then we go into this season that's like the season of searching or hoping or we don't know the thing that we're actually supposed to be doing during this season. I believe 
um, that that there are actually things that 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 people can do during this season that are supposed to do during this season that can kind of quantify how your heart feels. <laughs> it is the season of epiphany, and and this longing for epiphany can almost define how everyone feels around this time. The church calendar is brilliant. So, so here's our season at this point. So, so you have the Advent season. It's the four Sundays going up to Christmas. And then Christmas happens. It's the birth of Jesus. Then typically there's the 12 days of Christmas. There's the song, 12 days of Christmas, because the 12 days of Christmas, Christmas is the time that follows the birth of Jesus. And it's, it's like celebrating the things that God is bringing to earth. After the 12 days of Christmas, it's Jan, Jan, January the 6th. That brings in the time of Epiphany or the Feast of Kings. Um, it's, it, it's symbolized by the... Um, the searching of the Persian kings for the birth of Jesus or the place that Jesus had been during that time. It's following this, the this, this star in the sky. And that's how epiphany begins. It's this idea of searching and finding, hoping and dreaming. It's, it's this time of like, can things get better from our end? And it's this time of God saying, just watch what I do. Do. And so, so if you are in this place, this post-Christmas feeling, this, man, if Christmas could just be every day, I think you're feeling it correct because this technically is still Christmas. This is a part of the 12 days of Christmas season. And it's bringing us to this hope of searching or this, this season of searching and finding, hoping and dreaming and God saying, watch what I can do. Can you feel it? And it feels countercultural to the January 1st idea of uh, us creating goals of saying, watch what I can do. Because I've done that and I've played that game. And 2020 has been us as a, as a culture playing that game and falling flat on our face. And so for things to be different for us, I'm excited to experience epiphany to see the things that God is going to do. In this time of seeking and finding, hoping and dreaming as God invites us into epiphany. So epiphany is the thing that it is. It's you define a Honey, it's the eye-opening experience. It's, it's seeing something you have never seen before. It's, it's something happens and you have this epiphany. You, you're, the experience creates a new understanding of things. How incredible is it that epiphany and the practice of epiphany and, and the experience of epiphany happens every year? It's almost as if God says, you don't know everything. You haven't experienced everything. And there's so much more out there. I'm going to give you epiphany every year. I'm going to give you experiences that, that are going to open your eyes and, and I'm going to show you who I am in a different, new, fresh way every year. Seek me, hope for me, watch what I'm doing kind of way. And so I typically, if I'm preparing a teaching, the goal is, is to kind of package it and put a bow on it so it's this present. So by the end, it's like, wow, thank you. Here's a gift. But if I'm going to, to offer you the gift of epiphany, I can't package it for you. I just can simply say, here are some ideas. Here's some tidbits. Here's some ideas to practice. Here's some, some, some things to go in for this upcoming season. Because epiphany only is happening for those who are seeking. 
only those who are seeking are going to find. <laughs> and the experience is what opens your eyes. It isn't this content-driven experience. I cannot give you a teaching that's going to cause epiphany to come to life. But I can give you the gift that hasn't been packaged, that hasn't even been purchased. <laughs> I can give you the inspiration the, the thing that's behind the gift that inspires me that says, we are longing for epiphany. We are longing to see what God is going to do because God is making all things new. It's his promise. And this is the thing that the church has practiced for centuries in the season of epiphany. So typically there are different parts to the season of epiphany. Funny. There's the part um, that is personified by the Persian kings. And that part is, is central to this idea of God is light. He is hope. He is to be sought after. He is king. Uh, the Persians come and they find Jesus as king and they proclaim Jesus is king. It's a very tactile present type of thing. Then the second part of Epiphany is about John the Baptist and Jesus being baptized by John and God proclaiming Jesus as his son. So Jesus is God. Then the third part is the part of Epiphany that, 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 that Jesus in John 2 takes the, the b barrels of water and he blesses them and turns them into Fine. And it's this idea that Jesus is making all things new. And so he performs miracles. He takes these things and, and turns it into divinity. Like it's this beautiful idea. So there's this idea. The first part of epiphany is that Jesus is king. Then Jesus is God. And then Jesus is making all things new. Doesn't this sound kind of like a theme that we all have been, been like dreaming of and we're all feeling, especially going into 2021. 20, so I'm going to unpack just, just a bit these different themes of epiphany, hoping that you at home are going to engage these. Um, that, that during this season, as you are creating goals, as you are pressing into Jesus, that you are going to begin to, to see him, that you are going to begin to experience him, and that you experience the true season of epiphany, seeing the things that he can do compared to the things that you can do. This is a big difference. So the first part, the season of epiphany, Epiphany as to the Persian kings. The Persian kings had a prophecy from the prophet Daniel at, in 600 BC. So 600 BC, there was this prophecy about a king coming, a Messiah coming. And, and they had this idea that there would be a star in the sky that would point the place of the coming king. What is incredible to me at this point and in the th this whole package it's there is a huge time gap between the time of the prophecy and the time that the persian kings found jesus 600 years during that time there are 40 <laughs> generations 40 generations of Persians who are staring at the sky, who are studying the stars, who are, who are telling of the prophecy, who are hoping and dreaming. And then all of a sudden you have to think like, what would it be? I mean, like how would it feel to be the Persians who actually saw it happen? Because that prophecy got passed down and passed down, passed down, passed down, passed down. Forty gen er, generations are passing this down. And to be the people who are like, yes, it's time. It's our time. And to go on a journey following a star. How... Uh, <laughs> 
it seems silly. Like, like put it in perspective. Some of the most incredible people came from the Persian Empire. Like the Persian Empire was killing it. They were successful. And they, even at that time, they followed the star. They would have hope in a star that was prophesied. There is something really beautiful to that, that these people go on a journey. They pack up their caravan and say, I am following that. And someplace under that is going to be a king that's going to bring hope to the world. What would it be like to be people who keep our eyes on heaven, who will say, I am following that because my eyes are in Jesus. Because in Jesus, he is the king that will make all things new. In times of chaos, in times of hardship, in times of hope, in times of joy, my eyes are in Jesus and this is our time. Because of the things that have been passed down to us, we are given this gift this beautiful gift of keeping our eyes on Jesus because he always keeps his promises. This idea of Jesus is king is the first part of the season of Epiphany. The Persians come and they're from a totally different country, a different like faith background, a different, and they are the first people to come before Jesus and say, you are king, and they give him gifts. Be- being a king is something very present and something um, that's very tactile. It's, it's, uh, it's here on earth. It's this idea that Jesus is king. Like that's the thing the Persians were saying. And that's the thing that King Herod thought too, is, you know, king of the earth. It's a very present thing. And to say that Jesus is king is saying that Jesus has the ownership of everything here. I'm, I'm going to serve Jesus as king. The things he says, I will do. I am, I am his servant. Like, it's like that idea. And f- for these people on a journey to bow down before a baby and say, I will serve you. What a beautiful posture. This is how epiphany begins. The passage um, that, that, typically is associated to the, um, the, the Persians coming um, in the season of Epiphany is John 1. Um, this is the first passage of Epiphany. It's, it's, it's the intro to the book of John that he's talking about. In the beginning was the Word. And so since all of us are at home at this point, Get your Bibles, open them up, and open them to John 1. All of the Epiphany passages um, that I'm going to be talking today are about, are are coming from the book of John, and it's the first and second chapter. And so there's this picture that John is painting that, that Jesus has been there from the beginning, that he is light. And so this idea that the Persians followed him to this place of kingship and, and, and celebrating this idea that the Messiah is here. This is our first posture in John 1. I'm going to point you to something else about the book of John since all of our passages are from John. Um, it's simply that John First of all, he's my favorite um, because he's brilliant and really poetic and deep. And he's, he's like this good Jewish poet. And how he composes his gospel is, is his whole gospel is in this form of a chiasm. And, and um, a chiasm creates epiphany. Like to understand a good chiasm will create this oh my gosh, I've never seen that before in the end. And so John's going for that. It's like the book of epiphany. Um, so w- the thing that a chiasm is, it, it, I, it's, a, it, it, it's a hand-holding. It's an interpretation. So how he creates his book, being like a, a chiastic f- format, the first 
chapter interprets the final chapter, and the second chapter interprets the second to the end chapter, and third and fourth. And, and so it goes, and, and there at the center, you have this gospel that turns everything on its head, but they, they kind of like fold up and interpret each other. So, so, so if you engage John through this idea of he's trying to give us a bit more than just content, he is trying to create epiphany, um, you're going to have a lot of fun. And so there is plenty of time here. This is a digital service. So get your Bibles, pull your Bible open to John 1 and how he begins the first chapter is simply mind-blowing. Jesus was in the beginning and all things were created through and by him. And there's nothing at all that exists that wasn't made by him and through him. And the word and the word became flesh. Jesus was born. And I mean, like this is epiphany summarized. It's beautiful. So the first theme of Epiphany is Jesus is king. And the passage typically is John 1. And the second theme of Epiphany is um, John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. Um, Beautiful. Like, just just beautiful. It's, it's, it's this idea that here is this, this prophet, again, a prophet, who is, who is baptizing people in the Jordan. He could be b- baptizing them there in the holy city. He could be baptizing them, them in the temple because people got baptized all the time in the temple. But John was doing something different. He was baptizing the, the Hebrew people in the same place that, that their forefathers crossed from the desert into the things that were promised to them. He was standing in the desert. He called people out into the desert as if they forgot and Jesus showed up. Like Jesus showed up. And this whole thing is happening in John chapter 2. So if you have your b- Bibles and during the season of Epiphany, get into John chapter 2. And so, so he is baptizing people, bringing them back. You forgot this. And Jesus shows up. And again, Jesus could have been baptized in the temple. Jesus could have been baptized in the holy city, but he was going after a different type of baptism. And it was the baptism of John. As if he also is a part of this idea that he didn't want people to forget. And so during his baptism, an epiphany happens. Just as epiphany happened for the Persians. They sought and they found. And there was the wow epiphany. During the baptism of Jesus, so Jesus is coming. John sees him and he says, he proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God. Wow. I mean, like, can you even imagine, uh, first of all, being John, to be able to say that for the first time in history, pointing at God himself, saying, behold the Lamb of God. The epiphany that happened for everyone who was there. The epiphany that happened for John, like, Oh my gosh, it's here. And there comes Jesus towards John with the intent of being baptized. And John baptizes him. And as he comes up, the the heavens open up and a dove descends upon Jesus and the dove stays there. And there's an audible voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. If you think about an experience that changes perspective, you think about an experience that inspires you, you think about an experience that says, everything will be different from this point on. It is heaven itself saying, this is God, right? So the second theme of a epiphany is that Jesus is God. The first thing was that Jesus is king. 
Jesus is king. How would things be different if you truly believed Jesus is king? How would things be different? Like really, really different if you heard heaven proclaim and point out Jesus is God. Man, love it. Like I love it. What would it be like to sit in that understanding that everyone else there saw and what they all felt as God spoke the greatest epiphany of all time? Jesus is God. Then it turns us, it turns us to the end of John chapter 2. The passages of Epiphany hold hands. They're the first two chapters in the book of John. And so they point us towards the city of Cana. And so in Cana, there's this party that's happening. There's a couple who had just been married. And there's there's wine um, that's being served. And that's kind of like the big deal is is fine. It's expensive. It's valuable. It's the centerpiece of a party. And the party hadn't been over. It hadn't even been close to over. And they had been all out. And so um, there's this party that's happening. They are all out. And and then people began to panic. And, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, comes to Jesus. Jesus and says, you have to do something. I'm always curious as to the expectations that she had of Jesus. I mean, like, did she actually expect him to fix the problem? And I don't know. I guess she did. And at that point, there was this tension that Jesus had of should I do anything? So is it the time that I should show who I am, as if by doing, doing something, by solving this problem, this party problem, this wine problem, this heaven on earth problem, this is the point that the chiasm begins to play into effect. And I'll show you in a second. Because the thing that happens is Jesus chooses to fix the problem. And this is the third theme of epiphany. Jesus tells <laughs> tells his disciples to go over to these big fats containing water. And the thing that's special about these fats is they are, are set aside for the purpose of baptism. Because baptism is, a, is kind of a thing. It's a cultural thing for the Jewish people. And so if they're going to ever be in a spot that bad things could potentially happen, they bring their opportunity for baptism there so they can go get uh, perform baptismal practices before they go home, if you know what I mean. And so it's just like this uh, it's interesting. And so there are these barrels of baptismal water. Um, it's it's the, this like poetry of it's not supposed to be be like this. This is it's, it's taking advantage of like some of the promises of God. Like it's like that idea. Like it's taking advantage of things. There's these baptismal jars um, that that's that feels kind of like exploitation. And and so, so Jesus tells the disciples, go and get those jars. And, and they open the jars and this, these baptismal vats have been turned into wine. Like wine. And, and to make wine, the, the big thing here is time. It's time. It takes time to, to create wine. Wine and good wine takes ages. Like good wine takes a long time to happen. And you have to have good grapes to create wine. And Jesus takes water and makes the best wine 
instantly. There's this theme in Epiphany of the grace of Jesus. How things that people tend to think it takes a ton of time and there, there takes a long, it takes a long process and it takes a lot of the fire burning and it takes a lot of the pain, you know. I mean, like, he's like, no. <laughs> I will take something common. I'll take something, I'll take something that's very, um, very unassuming. I'll take something that's been exploited and I will turn it into something holy and good and expensive and valuable. And here's the place that the chiasm begins to take effect. It's this turning point. Because the chiasm, so the f f f first chapter parallels the final chapter and the second chapter parallels the second to the end and the third and so on. The, the chiasm for um, the first, the first miracle of Jesus, it par it, it's telling the story at the end of the crucifixion of Jesus. It, they hold hands. This interprets this, and this interprets this. There is this coming together. Together. There's a party that is happening. There is a, a heaven coming to earth. There's a bride and there's a bridegroom. And, and things are, are like the promises of God are being manifest. And to summarize all of it is water turning into wine. It's this idea of the grace of God. It's the things that are common are becoming uncommon. The things that have been poor are now the most expensive. The, this, this miracle of this thing that you could just pour or get, get a cup of from anyone has turned into this thing of the most expensive wine a person could get. It's this idea of time and grace and beauty and all things are being made new. The third theme of Advent is Jesus is making all things new. He's, he's making all things better. He's making all things whole. He's making all things really, really, really good. So Jesus is king. Jesus is God. And Jesus is making all things new. And the chiasm continues on. We, we take the story of John the Baptist and, and how, how it's this story of, of, of God proclaiming, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And, and John and the epiphany of, of all the people seeing what is happening and saying, oh my gosh, is this God? The chiastic hand-holding is the tomb is empty and Peter and the disciples are going to the tomb and it is gone and, and the body of Jesus is gone and they are having an epiphany. Is this God? And so the story of the baptism parallel parallels Easter and the tomb is empty and Jesus is risen as he did in his baptism. And of course, you have the story of the epiphany at the beginning when all things that the, 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 in the beginning was the word and the word and all of that, that stuff. And the epiphany st st story at the end of John is a st story of, of Jesus telling Peter, it's your turn. It's, it's your turn. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's Jesus shows up and he tells Peter, I'm hungry. Do you have any fish? Like, that's how the Gospel of John ends. As a, as a brilliant Jewish poet, John tells the story of Jesus who has come back from the dead, coming to his old best friend saying, I'm hungry. Do you have any fish? And the, it goes on to say, Jesus is telling Peter, it's your turn now. <laughs> it's time to feed my sheep. It's time to be the beginning of the church. In the beginning, all things. 
at this point, I'm curious about the epiphany of Peter. I'm curious about the epiphanies of the disciples. I'm very curious about the epiphanies that were being had because it was from this that Acts breaks forth. I am excited about the upcoming season of Epiphany because never before have I felt it so profound. We need it. We need to see Jesus as king. We need to see Jesus as God. We need to see Jesus making all things new. We desire it more than we ever have. There's this hunger and there's this passion. The challenge I have is it is very easy during this season to practice the opposite of a piff. Honey, it's to create these goals of how I'm going to be better. I'm going to do this. But I'm actually in the spot where I am tired of trying to be better. I'm, try, I'm tired of trying to do this, especially during the season of Epiphany, because Jesus is saying, Watch what I can do, watch who I am. I'll show you. I always keep my promises. Seek me. Find me. Hope. Dream. We're in this together. Join me. Let's do this. And Jesus always keeps his promises. And epiphanies come every year. If you are in a place that you are, are experiencing the days following the season of Christmas funk. It's because you are longing for epiphany. Because Christmas leads right into epiphany. They are dance partners and they are inviting us to join the dance. I invite you to practice epiphany. Get your Bibles. Turn to John. Go into John, engage John, invite the gospel to teach you and speak to you about Jesus is King, Jesus is God, and how he promises to make all things new. Because you and I know we need it. Thank you for, for the opportunity to speak and to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to journey alongside you because we are all just pointing towards heaven, keeping our eyes on Jesus and saying, it is time and under him, he is making all things new. Jesus, we thank you for, for the things you're doing. We thank you for the hope that you bring, the peace you bring, the joy you bring, the love you are we are watching you. We desire you. We hunger for you. Show us the things that you are doing. Bring epiphany to our soul. Inspire us to tell the stories that you are participating in. Jesus, you are King. You are Lord and you are God, and you are Father, and you are making all things new. In Christ I pray, in Christ I proclaim. Bye.
Jesus You did not speak You made no sound You died for your accusers And as your blood that we're in now God. come and speak to your children now we're listening you're worthy of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you jesus 
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. And you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Every from his word and then to respond in worship and to learn some new things about Epiphany. Um, KJ always brings in new insights, which is so life-giving and fun. Yeah. Um, and then the opportunity to respond in worship. And we wanna just remind you that maybe you don't feel like you're done just being in the Lord's presence. Um, we encourage you, even after I dismiss you with a blessing, feel free to kind of sit in this place Another song will be happening there. Feel free to sit in that place or maybe go back into parts of the message or, or whatever. But this is really about you and the Lord connecting in a very real and personal way. So we encourage you in that. Well, let me dismiss you now with a blessing. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, God bless you this week. Have a great New Year.
I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, and sings my soul, my Savior God. Sparing sin to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin and sing. My soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great! My soul, my Savior God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. How great.